What is up? Welcome to Vessel Church. Great to have all of you guys here with us today. If you're joining us online, we're excited that you're here with us as well. We've been going through the first few weeks of our church just talking about foundational principles that our church stands on. We talked about Jesus. We talked about truth. And today, we're going to talk about accountability. Ooh, so accountability. When you hear that word, guys, be honest, what does it make you feel when you hear the word accountability? Now think about it. Maybe you feel fearful. Maybe it makes you feel accused, maybe even vulnerable. You know, sometimes accountability, when someone says you're going to be accountable, it can be a scary thing. Because many times in the world when we're held accountable, whether it be a job or some other thing that we're doing, many times it could just turn into fault finding. Maybe it could turn into a thing where it's an individual versus an individual. And they're trying to get a leg up on you, make a power move, trying to get a competitive edge. And so it can be a negative thing like, man, they're going to hold me accountable. They're going to be finding negative things in me. They're coming after me. And yet that's not what God wants for accountability. And that's what we're going to look at today, accountability according to God. What is his plan? Now, last week in Hebrews 4, verse 13, we saw when we were studying truth, we, we came to see in the Bible that we will all give an account to God one day. We will all have to stand before God and give account for our lives. So the reason we need accountability in our lives in the church now is to get each other ready for that day. Get each other ready to give account to God, to help each other, protect each other, encourage one another. I'm going to say something right now, and if you get nothing else out of today, if this would stick with you, then it will be all worth it. To remember that connection brings protection. Connection brings protection. And so I want to begin here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, as Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus which is modern-day Turkey. And he writes here in chapter 4, verse 11, and this is such a great scripture just describing what church should be, what our relationships should be about, right? Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So it's just going through different roles in the church that people have. He says, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to build up the body of Christ. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children, tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning and cleverness and the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. You know, this is the church. In Ephesians 1 verse 22, it talks about the church. Jesus is the head of the church. And we we know that the church, what it is in the Greek, the original word, ekklesia, if you're from a Latin background, iglesia. What this word means is a group of people with a common person, the called out, the people that are called out together with a common purpose. It's it's about relationships. It's not a building with stained glass. It's not a certain place. It's actually the people. So I want you to ask yourself, have you ever in your lifetime wondered, why did God create church? Why did he make church? The whole concept of it. Why couldn't we just worship alone and that's it? Why does he command us to be part of a church, want us to be part of a church? And and have you ever thought, do we actually need it? Do we need to be part of a church? Yes, we do. And if you look in the scriptures, you'll understand why. I mean, look at the point of what he's talking about here in in the church and the relationships. Like, what's the point of it? Well, we've got to help each other reach maturity, to be able to grow up so we're no longer unstable little children spiritually who are thrown here and there by every wind of teaching and and doubt so easily, but we, we become mature. It's for maturity. It's for stability. It's to come to a full knowledge of Christ so that 
When someone says, well, what about this? And well, the, what about the Bible this? And you have your answers. You're rock solid. You're stable. You will not be thrown back and forth by every wind of teaching. No, you'll be solid. The relationships are to mature each other, to build stability, to be able to bring unity. When we all have a thorough knowledge of the truth and we, we have that maturity, we're going to better be able to work together. It's for unity. It's also so that all parts are properly working, as it talks about here, by the proper working of each individual part. In Colossians 1.28, it says the goal of the relationships is to present everyone mature in Christ. Spiritual relationships are a must. They're not an option. We absolutely need them. There are more one another scriptures. Love one another, do this one another. There's more of those in the Bible than anything else because relationships are crucial. They are absolutely a must for us. Again, remember, connection brings protection. If we're connected, if we have these spiritual relationships, we will mature, we will be stable, we will be unified. Connection brings protection. You know, in 1 Corinthians 12, it's a great scripture because it describes the church as the body of Christ. It describes it like a body. And it says each person in the church is a part of the body. One might be a hand, one might be a leg, one might be a foot, but every part is important. Every part is needed and how we need to stay connected. We need to work as one body. But it's interesting because I want you to think about this. If my finger were to be cut off, that finger without the body would die, right? That finger would just die. It would shrivel up and die. The body will heal and move forward. But the individual who's cut off from the body will die. And so you got to understand we need each other, guys. We need each other in the church, amen? And so you got you to gotta commit to that. You got to understand when you say Jesus is Lord, you must understand that Jesus and his people are a package deal. <laughs> you get Jesus, yes, and the Lord, and you get the grace. But you've also now committed to other Christians to be responsible for one another, to protect one another. Connection brings protection. So today I ask you, who's got your back spiritually? Who's in your spiritual corner? Who's fighting for you? Who's helping you get ready to give account to God? Who's in your life helping you to make sure you're good? And then the question for us as individuals is, are we resistant to close spiritual relationships? Do we put a hand up? Do we say, oh, I've got trust issues, so I can't let anyone close to me. Sorry, I love Jesus, but people are out here. Sorry, I can't, I can't be a part of that with the church. Are we fighting the devil alone? Connection brings protection. But we have an enemy that will fight against us, who will try to separate us. Let us be that cutoff finger that dies. He will work hard. And I want to look at a couple scriptures here just to, to allow us to understand some of the things that we will fight against when it comes to being a part of a body and, and having that accountability that protects us. In Proverbs 17, verse 19, reading from the NIV, listen to this scripture. This is incredible. It says, whoever loves a quarrel loves sin. Whoever builds a high gate is really secure. No, 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 no. That's not what it says, does it, right? No, it says whoever builds a high gate invites destruction. Invites destruction. Now, this seems like it was the opposite, right? What we think of is build high gates, put up security, keep people out. Man, that's secure. We're, that's going to bring us safety. But that's not actually what the Bible says. When we put up high gates... It says here, it invites destruction because you're separating yourself from the body of Christ. And it's the way we must think spiritually. See, you got to understand how the devil works and what he's trying to do with us. He's trying to separate you from those people who are put in your life to protect you, the church, the spiritual relationships that will be there for you, that will hold you accountable, encourage, give you everything to help you be strong. The devil's whole plan is to divide and conquer. I want you to 
ask yourself a question. How does the devil come after you? What does he do? What plan does he come up with to get you? If you're watching online with us, go ahead and put it in the comments. How does the devil come after you? What are some of the ways he tries to get you? Because he will work to come after us. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. As Peter's writing to the early church and they're being persecuted, they're going through challenges. In verse 8, this is a scary scripture. He says, be sober-minded and alert. Yeah, we need to be woke, right? We need to be woke. We need to be aware of what's going on, the spiritual battle we're in. He says, your adversary, that's right, we have an adversary. We have an enemy. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone he can devour. That's a frightening thought. You know, we had, uh, we had opportunity, Tracy and I, to go to South Africa one time on some mission work. And you know, when you, when you see lions in the wild, it's not like the lazy lions in the zoo. When you see them out in the wild, full of blood, tearing apart antelopes and looking at you like you're next, it's a whole different thing. But he says, that's what the devil's like, a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And this is how lions actually hunt. They will lie in that tall grass where you can hardly see them, and they will watch for the stragglers, the ones that will go off on their own or straggle behind. And they will pounce on that one to kill them. They don't take on the whole group. They find the ones that are separate. Or else they'll chase the pack, and then the weak ones who fall back alone, they will pounce on them. That's how the devil works. He wants us to be divided from our relationships that are made to strengthen us in the church. You know, many of you may have heard of the Spartans. They were uh, a part of the Greek culture. They were a certain city, a certain group of men who were... a highly trained militia. You might have seen the 300, right, that movie. That's not completely true, but, but they were highly trained, incredible, you know, warriors, right? And one of the techniques they would use if they were outnumbered by a larger force is they would, along the way they knew the people would be coming, they would set up like walls of hay and, and wood and stuff like that and throw pitch on it or something. And then what would happen is they would have to come over, and after a small group of them came over, they would shoot flaming arrows and light that wall on fire so now everyone behind it can't get over. And so they only have a small group that they could fight and go and take. And that's how they would separate, divide, and conquer to be able to win the war, to win the battle. And it's not that much different from the way the devil will work against us. Accountability is God's way to protect us from the schemes of the devil, the scheme of divide and conquer. Guys, we must remember, again, connection brings protection. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, connection brings protection. Okay, you could do better than that. Turn to your neighbor and say, connection brings protection. Yes. All right. That's right. We got to remember that, that we need each other. Guys, we need one another to fight this battle. Accountability is a good thing spiritually. Someone's got your back. Someone's going to fight for you, with you, help you. Man, that's what we need. You know, even in life, most people know we need mentors. Mentorship, people know it, whether it's in their job or sports or something else. You need mentors. A mentor is an experienced and trusted advisor, someone who has had victory, someone who knows where you want to go so they can help you. You know, AA, you know, some people go there, some people have to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, but one of the things they do there is they hook you up with another person to be an encouragement partner, someone who is, who's a mentor, someone who has been there, someone who's had success so they can help you as you go through things to be able to have victory. I mean, When we truly want victory, we will ask for help, right? When you truly want to have victory in something, you know that's the times you will open yourself up. Those are the times you go, man, I really want to lose weight. Man, I really want this exercise program to work. I know for me, when I truly, not not when I'm just like kind of, but when I really am committed to it, I'll call my friends and say, listen, I'm going to start this. I want you to hold me accountable. Ask me about it. Pray about it for me. And I'm not fearful of it because I want that. I want them to be there to be able to help me when I'm feeling lazy someday or I'm distracted. They help bring me back. I want that because I want victory, right? But you know how it is like if you're like, yeah, I want to eat better. 
but you're kind of like, but I don't know how serious I really want to be. <laughs> so it's like, right? So you don't really want to tell people close to you, hold you accountable because you're like, eh, I kind of want to do it on my own because you're not really that serious. And that's what the devil wants. But when you're serious, man, you, you work together. You know, it's funny, years back, we joined uh, this football league. Our church has a football team, and we joined this Christian football league, and, and we were getting in there. We were new. So the first year or two, we were getting beat up on. We didn't know how it worked. There were some great teams. But, man, then we got determined. We really wanted to win. So uh, there was a bunch of us that got together. We called ourselves the Dungeon Crew because we would work out in my basement. And we'd get in my basement, and it was Nate. It was Jared, JT, myself, and we would go down there, and we would lift weights. We had pictures of the team we wanted to beat, and if someone was being lazy, we would be like, do you think so-and-so from that team is at home quitting on the last reps? Do you think he's at home? Now that we would, like, fire each other up with it, right? It's like, come on, bro. You can do it. Let's get to it. The guys are like, oh, I don't know if I'm feeling right. Bro, come on over. You need to get here. We need to win. You think they're taking days off? And we would, we would inspire one another, right? We would be there for one another to help each other because our goal was the championship. And we pushed each other to get there. And we won that championship because we worked at it. We got other people involved. And we helped each other to be stronger, to be focused, and to win that championship. That's what happens when you have spiritual accountability. Connection brings protection. But the devil will try to come after you and divide you. And if you choose to be alone, you're asking for trouble. If you put up high gates and not let people spiritually close to you, I don't want you to ask me personal questions. I don't want you to get too close. You are fighting alone. Hey, let me use an example. Kurt Curvin, can you come on up here? All right, give it up for my brother, Curve. And uh, Curve and I know each other a long time. And uh, bro, just stand right here. Now, I want, I want to show you an example. If you were the devil, I want you to think about this. Are you going to come after the guy who's got a friend, maybe two or three that are close to him, the guy who he's got his Bible, he's in his Bible, he's got the scriptures? It's like, are you going to attack this guy where you have to come, between, you know, come through two or three other guys who got his back, the guy with the Bible, the guy who's aware of the battle, the guy who wants his team with him? You going to attack that guy? Or are you going to attack the guy over here who's like, oh, I don't read my Bible all the time. I'm just kind of unaware. This guy just walking around in obliviousness. No other friends to have to go through or watch his back. Which guy are you going to go for? This guy back here, I got the word. I got my friends. I'm strong. Or the oblivious guy over here. No help, unaware, fighting alone. I'm, I'm, I'm staying on this side because he's not going to come after me like he's going to come after that guy. Right? Thanks, bro. Give it up for Curve. All right. And so, guys, we have to understand. I just want to look through a couple more scriptures today to help us with this idea of spiritually having relationships and spiritual accountability to help us make it to heaven. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. As the writer is writing to the Christians from a Hebrew or Jewish background, he's, he's writing them because they're struggling in their faith, and he's giving them the prescription. He's giving them the keys to staying strong spiritually, right? So in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, the writer says, See to it. I'm going to stop right there. See to it. When someone says see to it, some versions say watch out. How important is that? Yeah, that's, that's important, right? See to it. Make sure this gets done. So what he's going to say is very important. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. You see, we have responsibility to one another responsibility to keep each other strong, responsibility to our brothers and sisters, our close friends, to not allow them to slip away, to have an unbelieving heart, a hard heart that turns away from God. No, we need to protect one another. It's the accountability. It's the spiritual relationships, right? It says, so here's what you do, verse 13. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. See, sin's deceitful. Sin can trick us. Many times we're in sin, we don't even realize it. We need an objective person to come and say, bro, I notice you're doing this. Or, bro, I see this sin in you. And you're like, what are you talking about? Like in Psalms, it says pride is like a necklace. Everyone else sees it, but not you. And you need someone to point it out, right? 
It's like those objective relationships to keep us from being deceived by the sin that creeps in our life. And, but here's what you do. You encourage one another daily. It's objective help. And he says, you know what you need to do? You need to do it daily. You need some contact daily. That's how serious the battle is. We might need encouragement on a daily basis. See, in the church, we recommend having peer relationships, people who are in the same situation as you, also mentoring relationships. Like if you're a young parent, maybe you find someone who's raised their kids to do well and have them mentor you. Someone who's experienced in an area you're not, get spiritual mentors. But then also spiritual peers, people who are in the same situation as you, you could help, you call them prayer partners, whatever, to help one another. But this is what this is really about. Listen, I am so grateful for my family and friends because there are times they need to sit me down and talk. Even recently, my family sat me down and said they have spiritual interventions with me, and we do it with each other to make a stop and talk to us about what's going on. And I'm so grateful to my family, my children, my wife, that they will sit down and speak honestly to me, hold me accountable, help me, encourage me, challenge me so that I could be my best and not be sinning. Connection brings protection. You know, maybe if you're married, you, you kind of have a natural built-in person, but maybe you get somebody outside of your marriage who's objective, maybe another married couple. In case you have stuff to work through, they can help you work through it. Maybe if you're, if you're roommates, you know, sometimes you're with your roommates, that's great. Maybe get somebody outside of your household to have an objective opinion, whatever. But to get people in your life, listen, the Bible says see to it. Make this happen. Today, if you don't have a spiritual relationship in your life, someone who will hold you accountable, encourage you, be there for you, find it. Find someone to, to be that person for you. We need help. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 23 and 25. I love the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 10, verses 23 and following. The writer says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Unswervingly. In other words, don't go way off the rails and have to come back. And then go way off the rails and come back. No, he's like, man, stay steady. It's that stability, that maturity we talked about, right? So he says, and let us consider. Now, stop right there. Consider. Interesting. The Greek word is katanumen. The word literally means to think about intensely. So consider. Think about intensely. He says, let us consider. Let us think about intensely how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching considering, thinking. Hey, first of all, how much do you think intensely about your close friends? I mean, seriously, how much of your time is spent thinking intensely about how you could help your friends? How much time do you spend praying intensely about your close friends and their spiritual needs? I mean, that's something we're called to do. This is what we must do. Consider one another, protect one another. So, we're thinking about each other. And there's a few things he breaks down, right? First of all, he says, how we can spur one another on toward love and good deeds. See, we should try to be pushing each other to do love and good deeds, right? So he says, spur on. Paroxman is the Greek word for it. It means to stir up, to provoke, to spur. You know, I don't know, might be some of you guys out there that like the TV show Yellowstone. It's kind of popular recently, right? All the Western dudes and stuff. But one thing you'll notice about them, they're on the horses, right? Horses could be stubborn. So if you notice on their boots, on the back of their boot, they have this real sharp little wheel, right? It's called a spur. And what it's for is when you're on the horse, you want it to go, you kick the horse with that spur. And that horse gets moving. It moves on toward love and good deeds. But the Bible says we need to spur one another on. Toward love and good deeds. Sometimes we need a kick in the backside. Sometimes we need someone to spur us on because maybe we got lazy. Maybe we were just oblivious. And we need someone to spur us on toward love and good deeds. Proverbs 27, 17 says it this way. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Well, yes. But when iron hits iron, sparks can fly. And sometimes you got to spur somebody on. There might be some sparks that fly. You need to say some tough things. To spur each other on toward, to help each other 
to get to love and good deeds. Ephesians 4, we read earlier, it says, speaking the truth in love, we grow up into Christ. We spur each other on toward love and good deeds. We spur each other on toward being like Jesus. That's what God wants us to do for one another. So today, how open are you to being spurred on? Are you going to be the horse who gets kicked and just quits? Or throws the rider off of him, just bucks him off? No. We have to accept and grow from it. How about, you? How about spurring others on? Are you a conflict avoider? Are you someone who will literally see sin hurting your friend, but you don't want to speak up about it because you don't want to be bothered? You don't want the conflict? You don't want to have to do that? What about hearing truth? Are we open to hearing truth when people speak the truth in love to us because they're trying to help us? Are we open to hearing truth? Are we open to speaking truth to others? It's a two-way street. We have to help one another, right? These are what the relationships are on. And why is this so important? Because we're getting each other ready to give account. You know, our, our football team, we, we like to win. <laughs> we like to be prepared. So we'll film the teams that we're going to be playing. We'll film the games that we play. And then in order to get better, we get together and we'll watch the film of our games. So we can see how we can get better. But it's a humbling experience. Because I, as the quarterback, have to watch when I completely missed a receiver, when I completely was oblivious to a certain coverage and threw an interception. Other guys are going to have to honestly see how they just missed blocks, ran wrong patterns. It's a humbling experience because you're all there looking at it, and guys are going to be like, oh, bro, you missed that block. You definitely got to be, oh, bro, you missed this over here. And, you know, what are we going to do, argue and storm out of the room? No, not if we want to win. If we want to win, we go, man, I got to get better. Man, I need to grow in this. But now we know what we could grow in. We can be better and stronger and be winners. That's what it is spiritually, these relationships. Connection brings protection. We need each other. To, to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. You know, there's a scripture in James chapter 4, verse 17. This is an interesting scripture because we know that there's sins that we commit, things that we do that are sinful. But there's another kind of sin called sin of omission. And James 4, verse 17 says, anyone who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. I mean, there are things we're supposed to be doing. And if we know we're supposed to and we don't, that's also sin. And you go, well, what kind of things? What is he talking about? Well, maybe things like reading your Bible. You know you should read your Bible. And yet many people are lazy about it and won't put in the time. They'll read more of the sports page or something else and not put time in the Bible. You know you ought to do it. It's sinful not to. You need someone to inspire you and spur you towards it. Maybe it's sharing your faith. We know that our purpose in life is to make other disciples, to share our faith with other people. Maybe we give in to cowardice and we don't do it. Maybe we need someone to spur us on towards that, spur us on to coming to church, spur us on to serving others. There are things we have to help each other do to grow spiritually. Guys, connection brings protection. Don't forget that. But the other thing he says to do besides spurring on is to encourage one another. We saw it in Hebrews 3, but also here. Encourage, parakalontes, means to exhort, to implore, to give Courage to one another because you will be discouraged. The devil wants to discourage you. He wants to tell you you're not good enough. He wants to tell you you don't want enough. He wants to tell you that you should be insecure because of this. He wants you to feel guilty for this. He wants to discourage you. Because if you don't feel good about yourself, you're not going to share with others or help others. That's how he comes after us. And he tries to divide us. He tries to divide us and pull us away from our friends who are trying to help us. That's part of his schemes, to pull us apart so we're easy hits because we're alone and we're insecure. We don't have protection, and he can eat us up. The world will beat us up. We need each other. Guys, accountability is key to making it to heaven. Accountability is not a bad thing. Accountability spiritual, spiritually with spiritual relationships is a lifesaver. It protects us. It's a good thing. It will encourage you when you're discouraged. It will spur you on when you're not doing what you need to. We will be getting each other ready to meet God and be ready to give an account. That's why we need one another, right? So when you think about accountability, remember, connection brings protection. We need relationships spiritually. 
It helps us. It's actually good. If you don't have an accountability partner today, ask somebody who brought you out to church. Talk to somebody. Find somebody to help keep you accountable, to be that person who has your back. So that you're not the oblivious person over here, but you're the guy over here with the scriptures, with your friends who are protecting you. The devil's going to have a lot of harder time with you than with the oblivious person. So let's get each other ready as we're about to take communion together. I want you to understand in John 16, verse 33, what Jesus says. When he's going to the cross, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And who doesn't want peace? Amen. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. Jesus says, be courageous. Take courage. Be encouraged. Because I have conquered the world. He has died on the cross. Open the door for us. He's given us grace for forgiveness for our sins. He's given us brothers and sisters in the church who have our back, who can help protect us. He's given us all we need to make it to heaven. So when you remember him going to the cross for you, let it inspire you and encourage you. Let it spur you on if it needs to, to find some close friends spiritually to help you make it to heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to learn from your word. Father, I pray that today we'd be inspired by the sacrifice Jesus gave to be able to have the accountability, to be able to live by the truth, to be able to be with you for eternity. Thank you for his sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for being here with us today. Grateful you're with here live and in person. Thank you for joining us if you're at home. Hey, let us know where you're watching from. We'd like to know where you're watching from if you're watching at home. Grateful for all of you. Hope you have a great week. See you next week. Thank you so much for joining us this Sunday here on Bessel Church YouTube channel. We go live every single Sunday. So please make sure you like, share, and subscribe to our channel so that you can stay up to date on everything that we do. We'll see you guys really soon. Enjoy your week. And please remember that when you're in our house, we hope you feel 